This week it will be 50 years since Martin Luther King Jr. gave these words in Washington, D.C. It's from his I Have a Dream speech given on August 28, 1963. Five score years ago, a great American, in whose symbolic shadow we stand, signed the Emancipation Proclamation. This momentous decree came as a great beacon light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering injustice. It came as a joyous daybreak to end the long night of captivity. But 100 years later, we must face the tragic fact that the Negro is still not free. 100 years later, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. 100 years later, the Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. One hundred years later, the Negro is still languishing in the corners of American society and finds himself an exile in his own land. So we have come here today to dramatize an appalling condition. In a sense, we have come to our nation's capital to cash a check. When the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. This note was a promise that all men would be guaranteed the inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is obvious today that America has defaulted on this promissory note insofar as her citizens of color are concerned. Instead of honoring this sacred obligation, America has given the Negro people a bad check which has come back marked insufficient funds. But we refuse to believe that the bank of justice is bankrupt. We refuse to believe that there are insufficient funds in the great vaults of opportunity of this nation. So we have come to cash this check, a check that will give us, upon demand, the riches of freedom and the security of justice. We have also come to this hallowed spot to remind America of the fierce urgency of now. This is no time to engage in the luxury of cooling off or to take the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. Now is the time to rise from the dark and desolate valley of segregation to the sunlit path of racial justice. Now is the time to open the doors of opportunity to all of God's children. Now is the time to lift our nation from the quicksands of racial injustice to the solid rock of brotherhood. It's wonderful to have the choir singing again. And again, I tell you my dream on this day of dreams, that someday when we call for the choir, all of you march up here <laughs> and turn around and sing. I also um, want to especially welcome Sandra Roach. She was in my meditation and I just passed over it and I welcome you back. We're so happy to have you with us. When Martin Luther King Jr. gave a speech from the Lincoln Memorial almost 50 years ago on August 28, 1963, he could see a new land on the horizon. On that day, Dr. King had gathered 250,000 civil rights supporters for the March on Washington for jobs and freedom.
On that day, he took the opportunity of that gathering to articulate dreams that have given hope to millions from that day. And in so doing, in articulating those dreams, I believe that he dreamed that new land into being. Yesterday morning, when I thought I should be writing, there was a poverty summit at the Crossroads, it was established by the Crossroads Urban Center and it was held at St. Mark's Episcopal Church downtown. And as I sat there listening about how different government policies were going to impact the most vulnerable of our society in areas such as nutrition, transportation, and health care, it was hard to feel hope that any of us could make a change. And we were a rather small group. I think that perhaps one of the greatest challenges of us humans is to continue to try to make a difference, to believe that we are making a difference by riding our bicycles, getting on public transportation and carpooling, turning off lights, gathering food as we do each month for crossroads. The voices that discourage us, that tell us that it is not worth it, come from inside us and outside our heads. And sometimes those voices are so loud that we can lose our courage to dream. So yesterday morning, I couldn't stay home and write this sermon and miss a poverty summit. And yet, sitting there, I could almost feel myself pushed out to see again, wondering if land would ever be in sight the land that Martin Luther King Jr. could see as he gave his speech 50 years ago. When I'm writing a sermon, it lives with me until I stand up here. So as I sat there in St. Mark's Social Hall, I thought about the challenges that this country faced 50 years ago. And as Dr. King spoke at the Lincoln Memorial, he took us even farther back into history to the Civil War, when brothers were killing brothers, each feeling that they were doing the work of God. Recently, Lou and I have been watching a PBS special I highly recommend called God in America. And it was watching that special that we learned that after Abraham Lincoln's son died, 150 years ago, he entered into a kind of no man's land. He lost sight of where he was going. In his personal life, he had lost his beloved son to typhoid fever. And grief is one of those desolate landscapes that no matter how many people are around you, you walk it alone. Within that sadness, Abraham Lincoln rethought everything in his life both personally and politically. While he grieved, a cruel war was raging around him. In his desolation, the impossibility of bringing his son back to life and all the impossible realities that had been blocking the dream of ending slavery. In the midst of all those impossible realities, he came to be able to see a land in the distance where all people could be free. He took a stand and he declared the slaves free. It is the messy realities that keep people from dreaming and thus from making change. And those messy realities were never more evident than they were during the Civil War. We Unitarian Universalists are proud of the abolitionists, many of them Universalists, who stood up to slavery. 
But at the same time, we must grapple with those wealthy Unitarians who were benefiting, and therefore our dom denomination was benefiting from slavery. They didn't have slaves working in their homes or around their gardens. They had investments in cotton and other products, and they were dependent on those, and those were dependent on the institution of slavery. And if we take that a step farther, you can see that many of the beautiful churches of Boston were built on the backs of slaves who suffered out of sight. When any major shift is made, people suffer. Any problem is more complex than it appears on the surface. Yesterday at the summit, there was talk of using more natural gas for the environment, but all I could think about was fracking. And as we delve into the realities that are attached to making changes, such as those we looked at during the Poverty Summit, if we look at all of the things attached to everything we do, that what we do something, people lose their jobs. When we think about all those things, we can become paralyzed and unable to make change. This complexity of making change swirled around Abraham Lincoln's world. Each day he read the words of the, the, not the words, he read the names of the soldiers reported dead. He did not want to go to bed with a number. He knew that they were each individuals with parents and relatives, and he had just lost a son. He knew loss. And in the middle of all the complexity, on January 1st, 1863, he issued the Emancipation Proclamation saying, if slavery is not wrong, nothing is wrong. I believe that it was during his time of grief that he reached a clarity of vision that speaks to us 150 years later. When Martin Luther King Jr. began his ministry in 1955 in Montgomery, Alabama, he thought that this would be a quiet ministry where he could finish his doctoral dissertation. And he did finish it. And soon after it, something happened that changed the world. Rosa Parks would not give up her seat on that bus. Have you ever felt like Rosa Parks did that day on the bus? She just couldn't do that thing any longer. Those of us who have lived as European Americans, it's hard for us to truly put ourselves in Rosa Parks' shoes. Yet many of us in this room have experienced other kinds of oppression. And we can imagine that feeling that we must be true to ourselves, be true to what we know. During the first part of the Civil War, President Lincoln believed that his role was to keep the Union together at any cost. And then he came to a point where he could see the horror of slavery and he knew that he had to take a stand and declare the slaves free. I imagine that each of the people I am speaking of felt their hearts beat fast when they knew that they would need to move ahead. They felt the fear that we humans feel when we decide to do something that goes against the flow around us. André Gide, a French author, wrote, one doesn't discover new lands without consenting to lose sight for a very long time of the shore. These words have spoken to me over and over again through the years. I have sometimes squinted at an empty horizon and looked for land or even a ship moving in my direction. 
And most of the people who come through those doors and sit with us for a meeting or two, or stay with us, sometimes for decades, I believe that most of us have experienced that feeling and taken a step out into that no man's land and have started to move in a new direction without a map. As in Andre Gide's words, you have embarked on a journey towards a new land. We talk of changing the world, knowing how hard it is to change the direction of our own lives. As I was embarking on my own great personal transition about 30 years ago, well, almost exactly 30 years ago, a man wanted me to stay on the shore with him. And he told me this story. He said, there was once a prisoner who looking out his prison window at night noticed the beauty of the stars. You can either concentrate, he said, on the bars on the window or the stars beyond. I told him, I want to get out of the prison. Many of us in this sanctuary have walked here into this sanctuary with our hearts set on freedom. In our board retreat last week, we talked about how many people come to our community during a transition. Our religious transitions group, led by Bill Dobbs, is a tradition in this congregation and plays an important role of accompanying people through change. Many, but not all of us, come here after leaving something that we could bear no longer. These times of transition are hard to navigate, and they are ripe for dreaming. This is a time when we have the opportunity to see the world differently. We are more able to dream of real change. And I think that we must be able to dream up that new place where we are going to arrive before we can arrive there. One aspect of Martin Luther King's Jr., Martin Luther King Jr.'s history that struck me this weekend is that Rosa Parks made that choice not to move to the back of the bus. Dr. King supported her, rallied people around her, inspired people to take up the challenge, and that is how I feel that I can be most effective here with you. It is better if you, not I, point in the direction or the directions that are taking your hearts. And when you do, I will do all that I can from the pulpit and out in the community to further your cause. Your cause will become my cause. So I ask you, is there a new land you can see that we can dream into being? What burns in your heart? In a service this springtime, we all discovered how much the environment is getting our attention, how much clean air is getting our attention, or the lack of it. And since we identified that, we have started on our way, we hope, to solar panels. And we had the clean air challenge. And there is more that we can do. The day after I gave that sermon, I couldn't take it anymore, and I bought an electric car. And we use that car for almost all our city needs, and our electric bill has gone up a whopping $7 a month. So don't let people talk you out of it. But there is more for us to do. We can make this a green sanctuary. We could have an ongoing clean air challenge. And there is that adopt a space that we began last week that we will continue in the next weeks. 
Because if we're going to advertise our green spirit, we need to be good neighbors and look like we enjoy the green around our sanctuary. And I must tell you that my own dreams are bubbling up. And on September 4th at noon, wearing a clergy collar, I will be lying on the pavement in front of the governor's mansion with other clergy <laughs> to make, you'll have to see it. <laughs> but we're protesting the limits that are being put on Medicaid. I dream. <laughs> I dream of a Salt Lake County that has marriage equality. If we can't get the whole state, we can at least do what Santa Fe County is doing in New Mexico. I have a dream that one day we will be able to breathe freely in this valley, even during the months of January and July. That this desert will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice and clean air. I have a dream that all our children and youth will be accepted in this nation, regardless of sexual or gender orientation or race or ethnic group or height or weight or the shape of their nose. I have a dream that bullying will be a thing of the past, that children 20 years from now will not know what that word means. One of the reasons we are meeting at, from 12, we're having what we call a community chat, is that you will be able to hear at that time all the things that are, that are at work in this congregation and give your ideas. Now, I want you to step back from my dreams and remember when you inhabited that no man's land, we enter on our way to change or because of change. I want you to all look in your programs. There should be a little piece of paper. If anyone doesn't have one, is there a little piece of paper? Yes. Okay. On, if you don't have one, these are the questions. What are you most passionate about in the world? The second question, how can this community help you live into that passion? And I want you to just take a couple of minutes don't think too deeply. You can write, you can send me an email later and say, P.S. I wasn't thinking of the most important thing. But let's take this time to write what it is that is the passion we have to change this world. Please. Does anyone have an extra one? Somebody next to them? Do you, do you have one on? Can I give you this one to a new person? Sorry. Is that okay? You can write on. You know what the questions are. Did you guys? Did you? Oh, you have one. Okay. <laughs> And those of you who are visiting, just think how you can influence us and nobody get, has to put their names. <laughs>
since most people have stopped writing, um, I invite you if, you, if you still have yours at the end of the meeting, just um, Jan will stand with a basket at the back and you can put it in his basket. It's kind of a hard job for one person. Thank you, Jan, and thank, I thank all of you for taking the time to write these things. They will not be forgotten. I will read all of them, and then the Social Action Council and I will try to figure out a way of making these things happen. I also invite you to be empowered to do what you write is your passion. Talk to the person next to you. They might have the same passion. Put a call out in happenings. Just send it to Lori Quigley, who's right there. I don't like to advertise the listserv, but you could also put it out on the listserv as a last resort. Because I imagine that there are like-minded people in this congregation who would love to join you. Part of why we come here is because it's hard to make change on your own. And it's much more fun to do it with other people. I see on the horizon adventures. And in the spirit of Martin Luther King Jr., let us dare to dream. Amen. May it be so.